Hello and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry in for Hashtag of the Year. It's Friday, 20 January 27th. This is Africa 54. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen wraps up her trip to Africa with a series of engagements in South Africa. Ahead of his trip to the Democratic Republic of Congo, Pope Francis urges Catholics to register to vote and hold the country's election body to account. And in our entertainment, Heather Maxwell speaks with San Francisco-based Nigerian artist Tosin Aribisala about his latest works. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has concluded her three-day working visit to South Africa following a series of engagements. During the trip, she met President Cyril Ramaphosa, the South African Treasury, and business leaders. The key purpose of her visit was to deepen economic ties and expand investment opportunities as a follow-up to President Joe Biden's promises at the recently held U.S. Africa Leaders Summit. Tusokumalo reports from Johannesburg. During her three-day visit to South Africa, Secretary Yellen engaged with leaders and officials in all areas of economic cooperation with special focus on areas where the country needs help most. It is her meeting with South Africa's Minister of Finance, which analysts have described as striking the right chords, coming at a time when South Africa's economy is in distress. The United States strongly values our relationship with South Africa. As you know, South Africa is the first country with a Just Energy Transition Partnership, or JETP, to which the United States was proud to commit as a partner. And South African officials did not take the visit lightly. Uh, this is therefore indeed a momentous occasion. There has been constructive cooperation between our two countries through the G20 and the Financial Stability Board. South Africa's energy crisis, which has seen citizens going for up to six hours without electricity, received great attention during her closed door meeting with President Cyril Ramaphosa. There is a frank set of exchange of views, very clear, from both the president as well as from Minister Montache that the question of moving towards a low carbon emission economy is not disputed. Mm. The only question is what does the transition look like? How long does it take? A task force to be formed will help fight poaching and wildlife trafficking and is said to become a great relief to what is seen as a big challenge in South Africa. The visit to the Ford Motor Manufacturing Plant just outside Pretoria demonstrated some of America's key investments in the country. However, analysts say the visit did not achieve much in moving South Africa's neutral stance on the war in Ukraine. And Lady Pando has been very clear, the Minister of International Affairs, on this issue, that South Africa is not going to be pushed to take a particular foreign policy position. Ordinary South Africans say it is only the practical implementation of all the agreements made that will make a meaningful impact on their lives. Tuso Kumalo for VOA News, Johannesburg. On to East Africa now, where Tanzania's opposition Chadema Party held its first public rally in six years this week after the government lifted a ban on such gatherings. However, critics doubt Tanzania's Party of the Revolution, the second longest ruling party in Africa, will stop squeezing opponents and say, and say a change in law is needed. Charles Kombe has more from Dar es Salaam. <laughs> Tanzania's opposition party for democracy and progress, known as Chadema, celebrates the lifting of six-year ban on their rallies, which the government said were a security concern. 
The party's Deputy Secretary General Benson Kigaila says during the ban, the state often targeted their members and supporters. The political environment was hard. Many people were arrested, and we had a lot of trumped-up cases. People were detained and tortured. In short, there were a lot of bad things that were done. Rest groups say the late former president of Tanzania, Johnny Magufuli, cracked down on critics. Since his death in 2021, President Samia Sulu Hassan has vowed a more open political space, including this month's lifting of the ban on political rallies. Our responsibility is to protect you to hold political rallies peacefully, finish well, and leave safely. That's our responsibility as the government. Your responsibility as a political party is to follow the laws and regulations. The chairman of Chadema, Freeman Bowie, spent seven months in jail on terrorism charges before the prosecution in March dropped the case. He says President Hassan's lifting the ban and meeting with opposition members makes him optimistic about the future. I congratulate Her Excellency, President Samia Hassan, on the way she agreed with our suggestions as Chadema during our meetings. She said to me, Honorable Boe, let's find a way and a tradition of agreeing with each other. This president agreed with what I suggested to her on behalf of all the Chadema supporters, and yet there are some people who want me to insult her. I will never do that. But Chadema and rights activists say Tanzania's president needs to move forward with reforming the constitution and laws so rights cannot be taken away by decree. Statements from leaders most of the time are not a good way to lead any democratic country. So, to ensure this right continues, we must have laws, because if we wait and depend on the president or the ruling party's decision, we will not be moving forward in democracy. If we move by what the laws are saying, it will help this right to continue to be applied well in our country. Meanwhile, Tanzania's opposition plans to take full advantage of the ban being lifted, with rallies planned all over the country. Charles Combe for VU News, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. The Catholic Church in Democratic Republic of Congo is gearing up for elections later this year by urging congregants to register to vote. The church is planning to deploy observers to hold the country's election body to account. David Doyle has more. It's mass at a church in Democratic Republic of Congo's capital, Kinshasa. But Father Victor Ntambwe is not just reciting psalms. He's also preaching the importance of voting. Every one of us has to do everything we can to get our voter card. We need to punish mediocrity. Our authorities are incapable. They do nothing. Congo's Catholic Church has a long history of promoting democracy. That's in a country where past elections have been complicated by financial and logistical problems, and where disputes over vote tampering have frequently caused widespread unrest. Now the church is gearing up to monitor elections scheduled for December. Abbots in Kinshasa are encouraging congregants to participate, and the church has erected street banners urging people to register. It's a way to hold to account those who are mediocre and to get competent leaders capable of resolving the problems that Congo is facing. The preparations are underway just as Congo, which is home to 45 million Catholics, prepares for next week's arrival of Pope Francis. It is the first papal visit since 1985. In the decades since, the Catholic Church has deployed thousands of observers before and during voting, as it seeks to hold governments and election bodies to account. At times, including in the last presidential election in 2018, its tallies have clashed with official results, raising concerns over fraud. Nancy McCullough is one of 600 accredited observers who oversaw the voter registration process. She's visited 15 registration centers over the past month. Speaking on Sunday, the day before enrollment was due to close, she said she has concerns. 
There are still a lot of people who did not get their voter cards. We don't know what to do. In this room, of all the machines we have, two of them do not work. Her worries have been heard. This year, for the first time, the National Episcopal Conference of Congo has partnered with the Church of Christ of Congo, a union of 64 Protestant and evangelical denominations. Based on more than 1,500 observer reports, they recommended that Congo's National Election Commission extend the registration deadline. On Sunday, it did just that, having acknowledged that some registration centers were not functioning properly. Potential voters now have until February 17th. David Doyle of Reuters fired that report. Uh, for more insight on the pontiff's upcoming trip to Africa, joining me live via Skype is Ntal Alimasi, President Emeritus of the National Association of African Catholics USA. Mr. Alimasi, first, thank you very much for joining us. And first, I want to ask you what impact can the Pope's visit to Congo have on the upcoming elections? Well, the, um, well what you should know uh, is that the, the Catholics make, um, I would say, the majority of, um, um, I would say, the, the population in, uh, in the DRC. So you have pretty much a big number of people. And if those people are all going to be listening intently to what, uh, you know, will happen during next week's visit, then um, the, um, the call for, like, the one that we heard from the Pope saying, like, urge the people to participate in the election becomes important. Mm -hmm. now, now, but... Go ahead, please. Uh, well, I wanted to ask you... The, just before the Pope tra uh, travels, he made a statement already about homosexuality. He said, it's not a crime, but it's a sin. How is this resonating uh, in the Catholic, uh, uh, community, among the Catholic communities in the DRC? And what are the implications of his statement? Well, the, um, th that's a, a very big question. Um, we know that um, in many places in Africa, um, homosexuality is legally, um, quote unquote, a crime. Now, the Pope comes out and he takes uh, that stand, which uh, personally I agree with as a statement. Um, and as he says that uh, it's, a, it's not a crime, it's a sin. So people uh, will be listening to that. Are they going to start reflecting really on the distinction that the Pope makes between a sin and um, a, um, a crime? I hope so, because it, it, in the end, what uh, uh, should be uh, in the mind of people is that the Pope is a spiritual leader. His role is to tell people about what the gospel says and what should be um, on the mind of uh, his, uh, his what's a flock. Now, when people consider other human beings as less than human beings, when people lack charity, which is mean where they lack uh, love in their hearts, that's also a sin. But is it a crime? Thank you. You know, thank you very much, uh, Ntal Alimasi, uh, for joining us today. Ntal Alimasi is the president emeritus of the National Association of African Catholics here in the United States. Now, coming back in the United States, in fact, U.S. President Joe Biden is calling for calm before the police department of Memphis, Tennessee, releases the body cam um, football, uh, rather footage of a brutal beating of the uh, Tyree Nichols, a 29-year-old African-American motorist by five police officers. The president said, outrage is understandable, but violence is never acceptable. Memphis and other U.S. cities are preparing for possible protests. Several dozen supporters joined Tyree Nichols' mother and stepfather last night in Memphis, Tennessee, for a candlelight vigil and prayer service. 
when that tape comes out tomorrow, mm. oh it's going to be horrific. My Lord, my Lord. I didn't see it, but from what I hear, it's going to be horrific. But I want each and every one of you to protest in peace. I don't want us burning up our cities, tearing up the streets. Yes, man. Because that's not what my son stood for. Yes, and if you guys are here for me and Tyree, yes. then you will protest peacefully. Yes, man. Well, Nichols died three days after being beaten by the officers earlier this month. Transparency and swift, methodical action have been our top priorities because the family of Mr. Nichols and our citizens deserve nothing less. The actions of these officers were awful, and no one, including law enforcement, is above the law. I assure you, we will do everything we can to keep this type of heinous act from happening again. Well, the officers, all of them African-American, have been charged with second-degree murder, aggravated assault, aggravated kidnapping, official misconduct, and official oppression. And all of the officers have been fired. Well, we, after a recent military pullout, only about 400 French troops remain in Burkina Faso to help the government fight Islamist militants linked to al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. But now, many in the country want Russia to help and the government has ordered all French troops to leave within the month. For several months, protesters in Burkina Faso's capital of Ouagadougou have gathered near the French embassy to protest the presence of French troops in the region. Not to France, down with France. We are here to ask the ambassador of France to return home. This is the second time we have asked him to leave Burkina Faso. Anti-French sentiment has grown recently due in part to what many see as the ineffectiveness of French troops in the fight against Islamic insurgents. Alongside the anti-French sentiment is a rising call for Russia to come join the fight. I think that a partnership with Russia can allow us to know a better tomorrow, instead of remaining glued to France without finding the solution. Some say that it's France itself that supplies the terrorists with arms. How can you get away with such a partner? Fact checkers working in Burkina Faso say increasing levels of disinformation suggesting French involvement with the terrorists has increased alongside the pro-Russian sentiment. Today, in terms of uh, the dissemination of information on the internet and social networks, there are plenty of lies that are widespread in Burkina Faso. Of the fake news we see, a lot of it is information aimed at forcing France to leave Burkina Faso. Saluka sees Russian influence in the rise of anti-French sentiment. If we analyze deeply, we can see that the Russians themselves are contributing to misinformation and manipulating the Burkina Bay. Because today, Russia is in an ideological war with the West. Military analysts say it's unclear how Russian troops or training might impact the fight against Islamic militants. But many protesters here are convinced Russian involvement will help bring an end to six unsuccessful years of fighting an Islamic insurgency. For Kader Traore in Ouagadougou, I'm Vincent McCory, VOA News. Well, we're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and all our VOA Africa programs on our website at voaafrica.com. Still to come, uh, we'll hear from Nigerian Afrobeat drama composer and educator Tosina Ribisala. The promise of a better life in a foreign land has become increasingly alluring to tens of thousands of Africans in recent years. But sadly, these promises have often come under false pretenses of new jobs where millions are finding themselves getting into a form of modern slavery, especially in the Middle Eastern countries, according to the International Labour Organization. 
On this week's edition of Our Voices, we'll ask what African countries are doing to fight against this crime that affect mostly women and girls. What agency can victims turn to for help? What can women seeking employment do to ensure they don't fall into the traffickers' traps? Join the conversation each week right here on Our Voices. In other news, Human Rights Watch is calling on Cameroon to launch an independent inquiry into the killing of Martinez Zogo, who was a popular radio journalist uh, that had spoken out against graft. The European Union's foreign policy, uh, policy chief, Josip Borrell, says he hopes South Africa will use its good relations with Russia to convict, convince it to stop the war in Ukraine. And Eritrea's information minister says Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov met President Isaias Afid Woki Thursday to shore up support for Russia, focusing on the dynamics of the war in Ukraine. Now, Senegal's former Prime Minister Amina Tatra uh, says she will keep fighting against a third candidacy of her former boss, President Macky Sall, who remains silent on his intention regarding the 2024 presidential election. Uh, Tory uh, told viewers Abdurrahman Idea that the parliament uh, uh, leadership decision to strip her from her seat is solely based on her decision to express opposition to a potential candidacy of President Saul in 2024. It's a violation of the law and it's, it's shameful for uh, Senegalese democracy. I, I think we went that far uh, and uh, what we are witnessing these days is uh, sort of a you know going backward um, and, and that's not acceptable because actually the 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 the, the bottom line which is uh, you know this uh, third term that uh, president makisal would like to seek and if he does that it would be in violation of the constitution in violation of his own um, words because he said uh, and he wrote in his book that uh, to 2019 was his last uh, run for any any election and it, it is clearly uh, stated in the constitution uh, that he is allowed to do only two terms um, so that's actually um, you know the the, the 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 bottom line of uh, you know the problem i'm having with this coalition because i couldn't i couldn't imagine uh, you know at all that president makisal would come uh, you know in 2023 uh, and uh, you know to, to try to he would try to to run again for a third time uh, you know that would uh, uh, be really a violation as I said of the democracy and it would be uh, for Senegal it would be very sad because we are very well known for our stability for our strong democratic process and uh, that's what allowed uh, President Macky Sall actually to be elected uh, 10 years back. Um, so I think it is his duty uh, to make sure that he is not going to take our democracy uh, backward uh, as we are witnessing it, uh, you know, in many African countries. So if he wants the tension in the country, um, you know, to decrease, he must go on TV and announce that he's going to keep his word, that he's going to respect the constitution and he would not run for a presidential election of 2024. Well, that was former Senegalese Prime Minister Aminata Torre speaking to VOS Abraham Idea. Well, in our entertainment report, California-based Nigerian Afrobeat drama composer and educator Tosin Aribisala has released some wonderful new music. VOA Music Time in Africa host Heather Maxwell spoke with him earlier this week to find out more about his music. Tosin Oribisala, it is so nice to see you again after several years. 
Nice to see you again as well. What is it like living in LA as a working African musician? It's great. It makes what you do, your art, to be embraceable by uh, a lot of people. So you have a new single out. Yes. Tell us about that. The Big Illusion is a song that I wrote uh, some time ago. Uh, I got contacted by the Afro-Latin Jazz Orchestra in New York. And they said, Tosin, you want to do something, some Afrobeat with Latin music. Do you have some originals that you can contribute? And I looked through my repertoire, my compositions, and I, I was like, you know what? I've never performed The Big Illusion live before. I just wrote it, took it to the studio, did a demo. So I presented it to them and they said, well, we love this. So we did that. We performed it live in New York on two different occasions. And during the pandemic, we did a um, like a remote recording. Everybody contributed their uh, own parts via video and audio and we put it together. So at that point, I thought to myself, why not release this as a single with all these great musicians playing this music with you? So that was what led to the release of the Big Illusion featuring Arturo O. Farrell on the piano and the Afro-Latin Jazz Orchestra. That's wonderful. What inspired you to come up with the lyrics the, 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 the lyrics. I'll tell you this funny story. When I came to the U.S. Uh, back in 2001 from Nigeria, I was shocked. You know, there's always that cultural shock. And, uh, and culture shock has to do with so many things, food, music, dressing, uh, politics, so many different things. That's the big illusion for me. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. that's very interesting. I guess you've learned. I guess you've learned exactly. to roll with the punches here in the U.S. Exactly. by now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> What else do you have in mind for 2023? For 2023, I um, have a song called OGF. OGF is in Yoruba, but it's basically talking about the down press, as the Rastafarians always say. It's uh, about the rejects of society, the down press, and being empowered mm -hmm. uh, eventually, because after the rain comes the sunshine after the storm comes some peace so after the storm comes some victory stuff like that so yeah. it's in that realm of thought last question when is the last time you were in nigeria 2019 were you doing music there i was doing music and then seeing family and yeah. friends and yeah. just enjoy Africa for what Africa is. All right. Well, Tosin Arigisola, thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, that was VOA Music Time in Africa, host Heather Maxwell speaking with Tosin Aribisala. Be sure to watch Heather's entertainment report every Friday here on Africa 54. And that's our show. Have a good night. Great weekend.